Oh, it looks like my mic is already working. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> I asked for, I can't even say it properly, a lavalier, lavalier, you know what I mean? One of these walking mics, just because I was going to probably walk up and down. Um, folks, it's a Friday afternoon, and we've kept the best till last. <laughs> Pricing, right? That's exciting stuff. So, um, so bear with me while we go through this. This is a really brand new class. It is an, uh, a subject matter that really hasn't often been talked about up till now. And um, I'm just going to set up here. Everything sounds loud. So hold on while I figure this out. OK. This training has been loosely developed from volume one of the contract pricing reference guide. That's a federal guide. It's actually, there's several volumes. Um, what I've done is I've taken really vital pricing information from that federal guide and combined it with our procurement life cycle. So basically what I'm trying to show you is when is pricing required and what is your responsibility and what do you have to do throughout the procurement life cycle. Um, if you have access to the manual that we sent you, uh, you'll be looking kind of through that manual as we go along. We've got the same slides in the manual that we do on the PowerPoint. If you don't have it, um, please go back. We did send it to you all. If we didn't, please come back to us and ask for that manual because that, that manual has so much more than what I'm going to be able to share with you today. So um, please use that as your guide. Um, just so you know, federal folks, uh, for cost and pricing classes, this is just pricing today. We're going to be looking at doing a costing class next year. But just for the kinds of things that I'm going to teach you in a, in a couple of hours, um, they have full week classes, 40-hour classes, two of them plus plus. So um, I have to apologize to you up front for giving you such a short class. but. Um, Perhaps at least this is better than nothing, right? Especially on a Friday afternoon. Do you want to have 40 hours right now? Probably not. All right. Um, let's see. Probably move on to procurement pricing. All right. Uh, I want to just make a note that throughout the manual, you'll see the words procurement, contracting, and acquisition. And they are interchangeable. We're basically, when we say one, we mean all three. All right, so for the first part of this class before the, the next break, we're going to be looking at the procurement planning part of the life cycle, the market research, um, and uh, then we'll move on to solicitation award and contract management close out after the break. All right, I know you've seen this a thousand times today, but it's, re it's really the new buzzword is our procurement life cycle. And I want to kind of go through it really slowly just to show you all the different places that uh, cost and pricing or pricing uh, fall into it. So first of all, in the procurement planning section, uh, you'll see there's an independent cost estimate, which is uh, what we ask government to do, and I'm going to get into what an independent cost estimate is. It's not as independent as some th folks think. It's, it's really more independent from the offers that you're getting, not independent from the government itself, but I'll, I'll get into that. Um, in market research, we have cost and pricing analysis. This is where we're going to be conducting market research, getting our information ready so that we've got a good good space to, to know what our offers are going to be giving us, what is the art of the possible, and how to negotiate good prices. At solicitation and award, we have to consider and, and analyze price fair and reasonableness. We have to do a determination in regards to that. Um, and, and this is typically where we, we look at the proposals to, to, to discover that. 
And contract management, there's actually two sections. One is the request for equitable adjustments. With modifications, there's typically a lot of consideration required with that. And so that's where your equitable adjustment analysis will come into hand. There's also the burn rate um, reviews that you need to consider, uh, especially with the complex contracts. And in completion and contract uh, closeout, we have final payment and closeout, which is also another pricing responsibility. So surprisingly enough, we have pricing responsibilities all the way throughout the procurement life cycle. And considering that we have pricing responsibilities all the way through the procurement life cycle, you would think we would have already have instilled um, training by now, but better late than ever. So here we go. All right, first of all, what's our statute say? Well, we've always had a requirement to conduct cost and pricing analysis. However, recently, the statute now includes language that procurement officers make sure our procurements are priced fair and reasonable. In addition, we need to write that down. We need to write down that analysis in an internal memorandum for the contract file. There are a couple of reasons why this is important. First, money spent on government procurements come from the tax we pay. Um, so it's our fiduciary responsibility to ensure we're getting the best, fair and reasonable price we can within the market. Second, the state has actually lost court cases in the past because even though we've made the basic calculations, you know, that cost formula um, to determine the lowest bidder, we have not necessarily conducted the analysis to prove price, price fair and reasonableness. Third, a lot of times we are conducting this analysis, but we're just not writing it down. Uh, cost and pricing data can be requested um, any time for any procurement over 100,000. What is fair and reasonable pricing? Well, price is defined as the amount the buyer pays for a product or service. However, however it's important to remember that if prices do not cover supplier costs and provide a profit, losses will occur. When a contract is priced below cost, performance risk increases. The contractor must finance contract performance with funds from other sources and contractor default is a real possibility. And I'm gonna talk about this again, about how it's not such a bad thing for contractors to include profit. Okay. When buying for the government, your primary pricing objective for all contract actions is to acquire supplies and services from responsible sources at fair and reasonable prices. Responsible sources at fair and reasonable prices. All right, fair and reasonable, what does that mean? There are two tests. What is fair and what is reasonable? What is fair? Buyers and sellers may have slightly different perceptions on this. Fair to the buyer. To be fair to the buyer, we want to pay a fair market value of the contract deliverable, delivered by a well-managed, responsible firm using reasonably efficient and economical methods of performance, plus a reasonable profit. What's fair to the seller? Well, to be fair to the seller, the price must be realistic in terms of the seller's ability to satisfy the terms and conditions of the contract. Risks of prices unfair to the seller. Why should you care if a low offer is unrealistic? Because an unrealistic price puts both parties at risk. The risk to the government is that the firm, to cut its losses, might cut corners on quality, deliver late, default, or refuse to deal with the government in the future. A fundamental aspect of this concept is that we as procurement officers are the business leaders and facilitators between the customer, our departments, and the contractor. We are in a business partnership with the seller, and we want to ensure that we aren't utilizing our power to deprive a business of their ability to continue as a going concern and to continue growing, providing jobs to our citizens. 
we must always look to a win-win answer that creates positive, professional, and trusted relationships. What is reasonable? A reasonable price is a price that a prudent and competent buyer would be willing to pay, given available data on market conditions and all inclusive costs. Your determine on determination on whether an offer is fair and reasonable is a matter of judgment. It's subjective. There's no simple formula on which you can just plug in a few values and receive a firm answer, otherwise I would have already sent you that Excel spreadsheet. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, fair and reasonable pricing. There's two notes I just want to add here on fair and reasonable pricing, and one is pricing each contract separately. It's human nature to try and balance one contract against another in terms of financial results. For example, a seller's position might be that a firm lost money on the last contract, therefore an effort should be made up to make up for that loss in the next contract. Or buyer's position might be that the contractor made too much profit on the last contract, and therefore the next contract should be uh, restructured to restrict profit. While these attitudes may be understandable, in a personal sense, they are not valid in government contracting. Secondly is contingencies. The government pricing objective requires that contracts exclude contingencies that cannot be reasonably estimated at the time of award. The manual goes into, gives a really great definition of what is a contingency that cannot be estimated versus a contingency that can be expected. All right, so although this class is about pricing specifically, I would like to at least define uh, the three focus areas for you here, which is price analysis, cost analysis, and cost realism analysis. So there's two methods for determining price reasonableness. When do you use price analysis? Always. Okay. And price analysis is the process of examining and evaluating a proposed price to determine if it is fair and reasonable without evaluating its separate cost estimates or elements and proposed profit. You always use this for every procurement. And the basis is typically a comparison of some set of prices to another. Cost analysis is as required, depending on the complexity of your procurement. It's the review and evaluation of the separate cost elements and proposed profit and fees. When an offerer is required to submit cost and pricing data, you can use this. Um, you want to support, you want it to support all proposed costs and profit and fee. Or you can require an offerer to submit cost information other than cost or pricing data to support your decision on price reasonableness or cost realism. And finally, we have cost realism, which is kind of in the middle of both of the, the two, first two, which is an analysis in the process of independently reviewing and evaluating specific elements in each offerer's proposed cost estimate to determine whether those elements are realistic to the work being performed, reflect a clear understanding of the requirements, and are consistent with their own technical proposal. All right, let's get into planning and market research. It could be argued, and I argue it a lot, that the planning and market research part of the life cycle phase is probably the most important, and really should be spending more time on that than any other phase. Why? Because if you do, uh, you know, we have data that shows that your successful contract, a, co a successful contract will happen, is more statistically likely if you spend more time in the planning section. Um, typically, we know that folks just want to get things procured and moving forward, but then after the fact, they struggle with the performance of it, um, and that's because there wasn't a lot of market research or planning put in at the, at the front of it. 
Uh, so market research and procurement planning are kind of intertwined, if you will. We separate them out just because there's so much uh, to tell you about in market research versus planning. Um, but really, they should be done in parallel and, and at the same time. What are you doing in the set of steps? Okay, you should be part of a procurement planning team, assisting the customer in defining their requirements based on the true needs as well as what is available in the marketplace. You will be determining risk expectations, strategizing on best contract type, defining the evaluation criteria you'll be using. Decisions made in the pre-solicitation phase of the procurement process will be key factors in defining what the government receives and the price the government will pay. For example, contracting decisions that increase performance costs will increase contract price. Limited competition will increase contract price. Facilitating competition should reduce contract price. Increasing contractor risk will increase contractor price. The better you understand the marketplace, the better you will be able to make decisions that will enable you to meet the needs of the government at a reasonable price. All right, let's get into the independent government estimate. There's a, a couple of words. You can call this an independent government estimate or an IGE or an independent cost estimate, which, is an, uh, which other folks call an ICE, ICE. It's developed by the customer technical specialist to give the procurement team and later the evaluation team an idea of what cost items one should expect to see on an offeror's proposal and what a reasonable contract price should be. Independent means that this estimate is not a cut and paste of the offeror's proposal, rather that a government personnel or their acquisition consultant is developing this estimate based on the research that is conducted in this phase. The manual outlook presumes the procurement specialist is obtaining this IGE from the customer and gives instruction as to how much reliance you can place on this estimate. There are four major questions to consider. How was the estimate made? What assumptions were made? What information and tools were used? And where was the information obtained? First, how was the estimate made? You must determine how each individual estimate was developed so that the questions concerning reliability can be examined. Estimates are often based on last unit price paid with no consideration of changes in the market situation. Second, what assumptions were made? Knowing and understanding those assumptions can give you an insight into the estimator's understanding of reliable estimate development. In pricing, there are no dumb questions. If you do not know, ask. It is your right and it's your responsibility. Let's look at an estimate example. The requester used the last price paid for an item to estimate the price of the same item 10 years later. Okay, the assumption is the requester has assumed that the last price paid was reasonable and that the market situation has not changed in 10 years. But with analysis over a few days or weeks, it may be reasonable to assume that the price has not changed and quantity, delivery, and other factors have not changed. But in this case, the last purchase was made 10 years ago. Normally, it's not reasonable to assume the price has not changed in 10 years. Once you identify the assumptions used in the estimate development, you can evaluate them and adjust them for anything that does not appear consistent with market realities. What information and tools were used? Well, the most successful estimators know their item. Before they make an estimate, they collect information on the product and market for that product. Their market research may be a one-time effort or part of an ongoing process. Find out if the estimator is familiar with the market, including the last price paid, general market price changes, current commercial market price, price breaks and possible substitutes. Market information is by itself not enough. 
We, the estimator must be able to apply appropriate analysis to estimate development. So we have reasoned analysis and quantitative techniques. And reasoned analysis is, uh, so it sets forth known information. It may or may not be supported by the use of quantitative techniques. However, anytime you can use quantitative techniques like using index data, market information, um, that definitely adds strength to the analysis. Estimated, oh sorry, estimates supported by words such as professional data, but no factual data and explanations about how that professional judgment was applied are typically of little value. Estimates based on good information, the application of appropriate quantitative techniques or reasoned analysis will generally be more accurate and easier to support through the procurement process. Okay, here's an example, professional judgment. Based on my 20 years of experience as a project engineer and my knowledge of the project, I estimate the price to be at $585,000. Well, that's a good start, but adding clear explanations of how the numbers are used in the estimate, along with quantitative data points, offer a much more reliable estimate. For example, we are requesting new high sensitivity replacement units. A year ago, a product could not be produced with this level of sensitivity to high frequency sound. Today, units with similar sensitivity improvements are available at a 30% higher price than the less sensitive units they replaced. Therefore, an estimated price for this unit, $585,000, is 30% higher than the $450,000 price last paid for the less sensitive unit that will replace. Where was this information obtained? Some sources of information are better than others. Knowing the sources of information will make it easier to evaluate the reliability of the estimate. While use of vendor catalogs and other methods of market research should be encouraged, estimators should be discouraged from contracting vendors for specific quotations. This is particularly true in sole source situations where the IGE may be the primary basis for determining price reasonableness. If both the estimate and the proposal come from the offerer, there's no independent measure of price reasonableness. If the estimator must contact a vendor for better, to better understand specifications, pricing, discounts, then two very important steps need to be taken. First, discuss the need to contact the vendor with your procurement officer and make it clear in writing, if possible, to the vendor that you are performing market research only and you are not requesting a quotation of any kind. Market research. As a minimum, your research should con um, consider the following data sources. Historical pricing data, published data, market research data from buyers and other experts, market research data from prospective offerers, data from other sources, and using market research to estimate probable price. Not all of the questions identified in the table will be valid for every procurement. And you'll see inside of your manual, they, they get quite deep into this area. Let me give you two examples. So you, you, can, you need to take your ability to analyze and pick the areas that are relevant to your procurement. So current competitive conditions. Do we have multiple sellers in the market to make it competitive? I know that often, especially on these islands, that's something to consider. And what about ownership costs? What repair and maintenance costs will there be over the lifetime? What are the warranty terms? All right, on page 43 of your manual, or paragraph 2.2.2.5, I give you a couple of websites to have a look at for your market research. They're um, starting with our SPO website, of course. We have some great information on our cooperative contracts, which you learned this morning. 
um, may be very helpful you, to you to find out what's fair and reasonable in the market for certain, certain goods and services. Also, the DBED uh, website is a really great one for key indicators in Hawaii specifically. Next are the GSA schedules, and although we aren't authorized to buy off GSA schedules in general, unless you're doing um, pre-disaster emergency procurements, um, it's really fantastic area for price evaluation, for price comparison. Um, so I would definitely have a look at that, which is um, the GSA schedules or GSA library. They've also got another name for it, which is GSA Advantage. So I, I kind of want to, I've given you some print screens here, so I want to walk through what it looks like and how you get through this stuff to find some good intel on cost and pricing. Does this still work if I walk away? Yes, it does. Okay. So. If you go to GSA Library, this is what it looks like over here. And um, I wonder, do I have a, a walkie? Yes, a walkie. Yeah, all right. Okay. So, say for example, we go to GSA Schedules. We've got a whole bunch of stuff here. There's disaster relief, hospitality, cleaning, chemicals. We're going to pick laboratory, scientific, and medical. All right. Then underneath that, you get a whole bunch of different categories. Professional and allied healthcare, staffing services, pharmaceuticals and drugs. Um, we're going to click on medical equipment and supplies. All right. Not so clear on screen, but better in your manual. All right, here's a category list of all the medical equipment and supplies. Let's pick adhesive tapes and adhesive bandages. This kind of screen will come up, and it's actually a list on the left hand, on your, on your left hand side, is a list of all the contractors that have contracts with GSA. And each one of them has a series of prices for this category. Um, right over here, there's going to be two sections of information that you can gather from. One is the actual contract the actual GSA contract that they have with GSA, and the second is GSA Advantage. If you click on GSA Advantage, it's like clicking on a digital marketplace, also similar to a less than sexy Amazon, if you will, um, which gives you typically a lot of times pictures if it's, if it's goods and a price right then and there. The contract, however, is also interesting because it gives you additional information like what are the terms and conditions? Uh, what are the warranty promises? What are the additional shipping expenses? Things like that that would maybe alter your adjustment of your price analysis to find what's reasonable in this market here geographically. Okay. So we clicked on a contract. And here's a look at some of the prices. So they typically will give you a table. Um, prices are usually at the end of the GSA contract. Um, and they'll give you, they can do this for services as well as goods. Um, this one is goods, and they'll give you the pricing and the explanation of the items. All right, here's another look at services. This one, same place, GSA schedules. This one, we're looking at scientific equipment and services. Services typically give you a little bit more information about what all is included in those um, categories. We're clicking on uh, electric testing and analysis services. Again, you'll get to the place where you see all the contractors under that area and access to their contract as well as to GSA Advantage. And then this is what their contract would look like with their service rates. So here you can see that they are charging $186.74 for their senior staff scientist. And remember, this price actually is bundled. It's including of all their fringe benefits, any profits, um, any additional prices, uh, any additional costs. They are already included in their price. So you don't have to adjust it after the fact.
All right. Another good place to go to is fedbizops.gov. This is a website that the feds have. Um, we're hoping to do with our hands um, site eventually in August next year. But basically, if you belong to the feds, this is where you put your solicitations on fedbizops. The nice thing about this is that you can cockroach what, whatever you can find on solicitations as well as awards because they also upload awards. So you've got, you can get hold of pricing um, information, but you can also get hold of really good um, ideas for how you want to form your solicitations. You want to get, it gets really good ideas on terms and conditions and certain requirements that perhaps you haven't thought of to ask. All right, here's an example um, of what I found in um, just a, a search on what's happening in Hawaii, what, solici what solicitations are going on in Hawaii. It's really small, but it's all kinds of things. So, you know, there's really a huge plethora of choice here of solicitations and awards that you can pick from. Make sure to look at all the options in the manual. There are really a few more really great sites that can help you with market research. All right, on page 55 of the manual, I want to start talking about government economic data. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times it sounds like, oh, what's that? I don't want to touch that. But that it's really, really helpful being able to access economic charts and tables to validate some of the prices or to invalidate some of the prices. So if your contract is saying in the last year or so, hey, you need to give me more money because my oil costs have gone up. Well, we know oil hasn't gone up, right? We know it's gone down. But to have that chart, that economic chart that shows that is a substantial um, Add, add, value add to your analysis that you put in the file. So here's a great example um, of using government economic data. So Bonnie Kahukui of our office actually went through this experience and so I've, I've just kind of copied and pasted her project here for us to have a look at. So she was uh, needing to determine whether or not to allow a price increase on our car rental contract. She researched several data points to come to a decision. The first chart she looked at was the consumer price index that shows the increase or decrease in general prices. Basically a view into how inflation is affecting our economy. For this purpose, there was an estimated average of a 1.5% increase. Next, Bonnie went to look at passenger car rental rates and she found an overall 2% increase in prices. Third, she looked at gasoline prices, and they had declined from January to April, with increases beginning back in May of 2016. In addition, she looked at new vehicle costs, showed very minor deviations since the beginning of the, of the calendar year. And finally, she even did a price comparison from April through December between the car rental companies. Taking all of this information together, she was able to surmise that yes, an increase of maybe one to 2% was acceptable and reasonable, but a much higher increase, which was what was originally asked for, did, was not reasonable. And so it's this kind of information that backs up your decision that makes it so powerful. It makes it so much harder for protests or for complaints or for ongoing um, painful discussions and meetings when you've got good data to back up your arguments. An additional tool for market research is encouraging early exchanges. Potential offers are a good source of information of market information planning purposes. It um, can identify and resolve concerns regarding, uh, regarding procurement strategy, the government requirement, proposal instructions, offer evaluation criteria, reference documents, and other industry concerns. 
There's various ways you can have early exchanges. Conferences, public hearings, one-on-one -on -one meetings, requests for information, pre-proposal conferences. But I think what's important to understand is before you publish your RFP, you are allowed to speak to contractors. Um, you are encouraged to because that is part of your market research. If, if you stop yourself or feel like you're not allowed to talk to the market, then how do you know what is price fair and reasonable? How do you know what kind of thing you're buying? That's part of your market research. It's when it becomes a perception issue. Like say, for example, you're looking at a really expensive system and you only speak to one contractor. Well, that's a problem. When you're doing market research, you need to look at the market and not just one contractor. So, you know, use a little bit of your, your sense in this respect, but I know a lot of folks phone me all the time and say, oh, will I speak to these people? And my first question is, if you haven't published your RFP, you should be good to go. Developing your price estimates. All right, here's a great example. And you know, I, I teach accounting and finance at the University of Phoenix. And we get these kinds of things all the time where it's just one big paragraph of numbers. And people generally, you know, don't aren't that happy about numbers in the first place. I, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe we all had terrible maths teachers in elementary school or something. But the best way to deal with this is to separate it out, put it in some kind of table or organization model for yourself that makes more sense. Um, it suddenly becomes so much clearer when you try and organize data in a way versus reading it in a paragraph. Um, so here's a great example. Let's see. We have a bunch of different prices that were collected through market research in different ways. So what have we got here? We've got using the price that you paid for the item 11 months ago, your estimate might be 19,700. If you lose, use the last price paid for the item plus 4% inflation, your estimate might be 20,488. The catalog price for the similar item from a commercial vendor might be $19,750. And the catalog price for comparable item from a second vendor might be $19,900. So that looks a, a lot easier just to read and, and to do a comparison. In the case of this estimate, the $19,750 appears most reasonable because it's based on a current catalog price. Procurement strategy. A vital part of your planning and market research is your procurement strategy, which includes procurement team members and looking at and identifying total life cycle costs. The manual on page 68 gets really into ex explanations on who's part of that team, and you've already heard it in contract management. It's so, so important as the procurement officer to not just be able to not be doing this by themselves. This is a team effort, especially for the bigger, more complex procurements, and you need to get everyone in at the beginning, because you don't know what the attorney's going to say. You don't know if the technical guy is going to add things that maybe you need to make sure is included in there. What about the customer? What kind of performance quality is the customer expecting? How will you know unless you bring them all together up front? Secondly, we have life cycle costs. And this kind of really pertains to the procurement life cycle, which we're kind of trying to drum into your brains is that there are procurement life cycle costs for procurements. And when you are looking at and comparing prices and doing a price analysis, you need to look at all the costs. Now, some of the additional costs, let's see, could be delivery, installation of an item, operating and support costs, 
um, supplies and services needed to operate and maintain an operational system? What about disposal costs, um, surge costs and handover costs? There might be a period of six months or more where the incumbent might have to work hand in hand with the new contractor on an organized handover. Also during that contract period, there might be periods of known surge requirements that should be included in the life cycle cost. All right, and then <clears throat> we have this great example on lease versus purchase. <coughs> Excuse me, lots of talking. I get very excited about this example, um, but I think some of you may not. So I'm not gonna spend too much time, but I wanna kinda give you the general outlook of the thing. What we should always be asking ourselves, does it make more sense to purchase or lease? Or does it, can we do it in-house versus externally? These are the kinds of questions we, we and the program manager and the budget and finance guys should be asking right up front. Um, this is an example of lease versus purchase and to try and figure out which one's better for us, we have to really turn these into uh, a kind of apples and apples versus apples and oranges comparison. So what happens here? In this scenario, we have purchase of equipment um, for $146,000 at the beginning of year one. Nothing going on at the end of year one. But for a lease, we'd have to pay $70,000 at the beginning of year one and $70,000 at the end of year one. And then in year two, we have got um, uh, $12,000 that we might receive on the sale of the equipment if we buy it, okay, versus nothing going on at the end of the year or two for the lease. Well, to compare it, this is where it gets exciting. You can use an Excel spreadsheet and do a present value uh, calculation of any future amounts. So what we're doing is we're discounting back to the present with those future amounts. Well, how much is 70000 in the end of year one discounted to the present value? And what is the 12,000 discounted to? And you add those up together and you find out, ooh, not yet. <laughs> and you find out the evaluated price, which is much more comparable now because now you're looking at the present value of all future costs. And the great thing about Excel is that it really does all these functions for you nowadays, and it really kind of walks you through it too. So um, always happy. I love Excel. I write my letters on Excel. I've been working on Excel for 20 years. I can even tell you that the third version of Excel had special secret keys that if you keyed them in, you could get to fly through Mars, all the valleys through Mars. It was all, anyway. Um, but if anyone ever wants to learn more about Excel, I think for the purpose of cost and pricing, you need to have a basic understanding of Excel. If you want to impress your management and get it promoted, do an Excel class because there are so many cool things. Uh, managers want to see pictures. They don't want to see writing. So if you can give them pivot charts and pie charts and cool dashboards, it's very cool, it's very cool. So please, if you ever feel like you need, you have questions on Excel, please call me, because I love, I get really nerdish about that stuff, but okay. So this is our break time. I don't know if I'm, I'm a little early, but I figured I'm sure you don't mind. Um, I just thought this was a great Halloween costume option. This is actually a guy, because you can tell from his hands, right? Kind of creepy. At least it's not a clown face. <laughs> All right, so um, please go ahead and take a break and we'll get started at 3.30. Thank you very much. <laughs> Folks, this is your last hour before the bar opens. <laughs> I'm very excited about that. 
All righty. For our final hour of pricing in procurement, let's talk about the section of solicitation and award. And this is where we really look at the proposals we've been given and we have to find it price fair and reasonable. So this is where we're going to really get into what price analysis is and, and what it's made up of and, and how you can um, use the tools. First of all, let's talk about responsibility. Sometimes the lowest bid is based on the false perception that this bid over the course of the subsequent performance of the contract will actually offer the original savings. It can be false economy if there is subsequent default, late deliveries, or other unsatisfactory performance resulting in additional contractual or administrative costs. While it is important that government always looks for uh, purchases made at the lowest price, this does not require an award to a supplier solely because that supplier submits the lowest offer. A prospective contractor must affirmatively demonstrate its responsibility. So they have to be responsible as well as the lowest price. Um, the burden is on the offerer to affirm the, its ability to perform at that price. Important. You cannot make a determination of price reasonableness based on price comparison with an offer that is technically unacceptable or an offer submitted by a firm that is not responsible. So if you get, you know, if you do a competition and you're trying to show that your awardee who is responsible and technically acceptable is fair in the market using comparison against someone who is not technically acceptable or not responsible, that is not acceptable. Because it basically, uh, if they aren't responsible, then who knows if those prices are reasonable. You know, they might be low, but that might be for another reason. All right, price analysis. Again, the process of examining and evaluating a proposed price to determine if it's fair and reasonable without evaluating its separate cost elements and profit. It always involves some kind of comparison with another price. And the basis of for your comparison should be a price that has been determined a reasonable estimate of a price a reasonable person would be willing to pay. Should pay price is, is kind of similar to um, an independent government estimate. It's just a combination of that and your other market research to come up with, well, what's the range or the area of what we should be paying? The should pay, should pay price used for comparison is the price that, in your best judgment, the government should reasonably expect to pay. Um, for the deliverable, and it includes things like validated commercial prices, pricing yardsticks, and your independent government estimate. Remember, your should pay price is an estimate, and therefore just an approximation of the price the government should pay. So, by definition, an exact. If you get a different number um, that's close to but not exactly, uh, be amenable to those offers and investigate the reasons if there are significant variances. During your analysis, you will need to account for the differences in the offered price to your expected price range. There might be added options included in the offer, or perhaps the offer has a cheaper, more innovative approach than your team had considered. Remember to consider similar characteristics to make the comparison meaningful. Page 83 of your manual shows the process for making price comparisons. There are five steps. Step one is selecting the prices for comparison. The best starting place is to look at other proposed prices. Are they from responsible sources? Then is the comparison between your goods and services, are those found in published price lists, valid? Two, identify factors that affect comparability. Consider what geographic location. For example, a previously proposed price for Maui might be different for Oahu. What is the extent of the competition? Fewer sources typically mean higher prices. 
has technology changed since the previously proposed price? And what about differing terms and conditions? Step three is to determine the potential impact of these factors on prices selected for comparison. How substantial is the impact? A geographic separation between Maui and Oahu might not substantially affect the price, whereas a new technology could radically change price. Step four, adjust prices selected for comparison. Remember you are looking to compare apples to apples. If you, if you have a previously proposed price from three years ago, use an index number chart, such as a consumer price index, to calculate the inflation rate growth to increase the price to a more reasonable number for today. Have your technical subject matter experts give you information on trends in industry and use price volume analysis, which we'll learn in cost, cost pricing analysis class, to adjust quantity, size, and volume for comparison. And finally, step five, compare offered prices with adjusted prices. Consider how much reliance to place on each comparison. This section covers comparability in more detail. Remember, the procurement officer is responsible for making the determination that an offered price is fair and reasonable and for selecting the basis for comparing that price. The basis of the proposed price and comparison prices must be analyzed and documented for the contract file. How does that document look? That's not important. I mean, it, it's basically a memorandum for record internal to your contract file Typically, no one will even ever look for it or ask for it. But the nice thing about writing something in your file is two years from now when there's a scandal or the media decides to look into it or somebody wants to find out about your contract, you don't have to try and remember what happened because it's all already written and substantiated in your contract file. And that's the great thing about documenting for your file. Not saying that's going to happen every time, but I'm saying if that happens. All right. Price analysis. The basis for price analysis comparisons in order of desirability. All right. Comparisons of competitive proposals for adequate price competition. Obviously, this, this one should be first, because if you've got a competed uh, procurement, it's, pretty, it's, it's much easier than, um, than finding um, prices fair and reasonable in any other area. What about prior competitive purchase orders? Contracts with the same similar items, historical. Comparison for previous invoices for the same or similar item. What about catalogs, published price lists, GSA federal supply schedule, which is what we looked at earlier. Prices or labor rates set by law, for example, a minimum wage or union labor agreements. Recognized price indices, professionals, materials, equipment, national, regional, or local agreements, and comparison with internal or your independent estimate. Page 88 of the manual talks to how price analysis varies depending on the estimated dollar value of the contract. So this, uh, for example, if you have a micro purchase, which is under 2,500, it doesn't make sense to spend all those resource hours doing great in detail, in depth price analysis for something that's $50. You've got to be able to weigh the benefits. Um, in that case, you would only look to see if something was priced reasonable if you had the feeling that it wasn't. Then for small purchases, Comparing competitive quotes is the preferred method for pricing. If you only receive one quote, well, that's when you need to delve in a little deeper. But for contracts above the small purchase threshold, which is for goods and services, 100,000, and for construction, 250,000, you would look at the list of price analysis comparisons. The apparent successful offerer has such a decided advantage that is practically immune from competition. These are areas where you would put less reliance um, on proposed prices, where the apparent successful offerer's price is significantly different, higher or lower, than the next rated offerer. This could indicate that there is a mistaken bid, 
a misunderstanding of the contract requirements, and so on. In this situation, you should take steps to verify the offeror's bid and or use another technique to analyze the price. Government requirements permit offerors to propose widely different technical approaches to contract performance. For example, a ceramic mug and a paper cup may both meet a requirement to hold eight ounces of coffee, but that doesn't mean that a $1 price for a paper cup is reasonable because it is less than the $5 price for a ceramic mug. Even if no offerer is proposing to provide a paper cup, the key element of your price analysis should be to compare the paper cup offer with prices paid for similar paper cups. So hopefully that's clear. <laughs> All right, here we have another one of these great examples where you get everything smashed into a paragraph um, to try and find competitive uh, price analysis. So commercial prices are prices being paid by the general public for product. Here's an example of a fair and reasonable justification. So the agency is unable to enroll in, you can see Whisker 10-01, it's now would be a NASPO value point contract, due to the cooperative agreement start a year ago. HP is able to provide HP Design Jet T1200 HD multifunction printer for 17,913. We also have a couple of other competitors, CDW and um, who's the other guy? Amazon. So a comparative table below displays the price of the three companies while supplying the warranty directly from HP as the manufacturer below are the quotes that support this justification. So this whole document could suffice as your price reasonable justification that you would throw into your contract file. As simple as that. And it's very clear, especially with the table, which, which one and why you're choosing the one you're choosing. I mean, in this case, when it comes to goods, it's much easier to just, you know, to pick a lowest bid because you know that the quality for all three are acceptable. The manual does go on to give more details on previously proposed prices and independent government estimates. So we'll pick, pick, up, um, pick back up on page 97 of the manual for those who have it and talk about factors that affect comparability. So market conditions change. The passage of time usually is accompanied by changes in supply, demand, technology, product designs, pricing strategies, laws and regulations that affect suppliers' costs and other such factors. Look instead for prices that were established under similar terms and market conditions. Variations in quantity can have a significant impact on in unit price. Typically, if you buy in bulk, you should receive a higher discount. But this may not be so if supplier cannot handle the large volume that you want to order. Here in Hawaii, we always need to consider geographic location. Check for differences in the level competition that may affect price comparisons, and check freight requirements and accompanying costs. These can vary considerably considerably, especially for chemicals and other hazardous materials. Purchasing power, use price index numbers to adjust for the changing value of the dollar over time. It is fair and reasonable to expect an older proposed price would increase due to inflation eroding the real value of money. And you can do this for services too, when, they, when you get a proposal for five years' worth of services, the contractor can easily just say, oh, we're increasing our, our hourly rates every year by 4% to adjust for inflation. And you could come back and say, oh, no, 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 CPI says 2%. You can increase it by 2%, and that's acceptable and reasonable. Extent of competition. The last time you solicited for this good or service, you may have received only one quote. Now the environment might have changed and there will be more competition, which is why as a CPO, we only look at, um, we look at sole sources every year, um, just in case we have got changed competition in the market. 
Terms and conditions include things like packaging, delivery, financing, discounts, payment terms. Prices on contracts for delivery in 90 days may well be higher than those for delivery in 180 days because the contractor may have to hire additional employees or pay overtime to expedite manufacturing to meet the shorter delivery date. When the government has other complex demands or urgent delivery requirements may cause the price to be significantly higher than usual. So that's why you'll see the push is towards government being less specific on their designs and requirements and more aligned with what's happening in the commercial markets. Technology. Prices from dying industries can rise because the technologies don't keep pace with rising costs. Conversely, technological advances in growth industries can drive prices down. And government unique requirements. Our state laws re may require specific unique requirements that are not required in commercial market transactions. I know we could just name a whole bunch right here. These differences will also affect price comparisons. How do we know we're getting a fair and reasonable price in the following? These are the areas that we may have to spend extra time on, looking at analysis for price and fair reasonableness. Even in an emergency such as a declared disaster, prices still have to be found fair and reasonable, or FEMA can refuse to pay it. They even ask for you to look for three uh, competitive offers. Isn't that amazing? You would think, and I thought just until recently, oh, well, it's an emergency, just pick whoever. If it's the mafia guy down the road, just, you know, if you're saving lives. But apparently not, not if you want to get paid back by FEMA. So good to know for the future. Solicitation and award, unbalanced bids. A word on unbalanced bids. This is on page 107 or section 3.7. There are times when you will receive unbalanced pricing. You need to know how to recognize this and how to understand the risk that's involved. Unbalanced pricing exists when, despite an acceptable total evaluated price, the price of one or more contract line items is significantly over or understated, as indicated by application of a cost or price analysis techniques. This can increase contract performance risk or result in payment of an unreasonably high price. So a bid is materially unbalanced if it is mathematically unbalanced and one of the following is true. There is reasonable doubt that the lowest evaluated bid will actually result in the lowest cost to the government. The offer is so grossly unbalanced that its acceptance would be tantamount to allowing an advanced payment. A bid is mathematically unbalanced if it's based on prices that are significantly less than cost for some line items and significantly more than cost for other line items. In fact, I think we have someone in the audience who's dealt with this before. Anyone who wants to know the story on that can ask Tammy Lee from DOT. Thank you, Tammy Lee. <laughs> All right, uh, price-related decision process. This is a great tool and a document. You see the book really talks about this. It's a template for you to put your thoughts down on paper. It really gives you the opportunity to consider in a way, a negotiation for the kinds of line items and the total price you want to end up paying. Now, of course, we don't have the opportunity to openly negotiate like the commercial world does, but we do have options to negotiate um, in a way of the way we do discussions um, and also post-award. So uh, having something like this, which is kind of like a pre-negotiation objective document establishes an initial negotiation position and assists in determining whether a price is fair and reasonable. First, you should analyze the risk of the proposed prices and consider how realistic they may be. Second, you should develop price positions and data points that will substantiate your positions. 
This is even more important during contract modification or change order negotiations. A price discussion memorandum will document your price objectives. So you can see there they've got proposed prices, the objective, which is, I guess, what we're trying to achieve, the considered achieved, and a reference, which would be your notes, oh, well, this happened. We, you know, we talked through whatever the issue was, computer hardware, for example, and we came up to that achieved price. It's a really great way of documenting what happened and what was the conversation for anyone who asked questions later. All right, so here we are at contract management and close up, steps four and five of the life cycle, page 117 in the manual. Starting off with the request for equitable adjustments. So you've already been through this in contract management class where we talk about the difference between a unilateral and a bilateral modification. Um, we prefer bilateral modifications because it means both parties sign, um, and that means both parties adhere and are on the same level um, as to what the decision is. Uh, there are certain advantages in an equitable adjustment negotiation from both sides, from the contractor and the government side. For example, an equitable adjustment negotiation may provide the contractor with negotiation advantages not present before contract award, obviously. And their negotiations are non-competitive. Pricing alternatives on the original contract may have been limited by competition. Whereas for the government, the contractor performance must continue, so the government is not faced with a lack of progress in meeting its needs, typically speaking. A bilateral negotiated agreement is generally a better deal for both sides because a unilateral contractor's officer's decision may give the impression that of being a win-lose, no matter how reasonable it is. So it really gives out a bad perception. Disputes are long and expensive for both parties involved. If government wins, the contracting officer's decision may still appear one-sided to the contractor. If the contractor wins, it appears that the government adopted a win-lose position and lost. All right. Contract management funding logs and burn rate logs are vital to maintain an ongoing level of knowledge of how the funding for the contract's being used. How fast are we burning through our money and what is the balance at any one time? It's important to keep a log, especially on large complex contracts where, no, where many funding modifications are being processed. This is especially true when there is no e-procurement to accounting system available to track and view these transactions like, like we basically have in the executive right now. Here is an example of a burn rate log. See, I threw in a pivot chart. I get kind of excited about Excel, as you know. Um, and you can see how fast, basically the blue line is showing you how you should have spent your money every month and the red line is showing you where you are at. And you see how quickly and easily you can see that from a picture? And that's the, that's the tool that management loves to see because if they look at the numbers, they'll eventually figure it out. But it's just quicker this way. So you should set a quarterly meeting to discuss the burn rate with your contractor to ensure you have enough funds to maintain the contract for the full year and or to obtain your deliverables before the money runs out or to partially terminate a section of the contract to manage through the funds that you have. It just gives you the option to make those decisions in a timely manner um, rather than getting to the end of the contract and going, oh my god, now what? Termination settlements. When the government terminates partially or wholly for convenience, the contractor may be authorized to submit settlement expenses. Commercial contract termination for convenience settlements center on determining the percentage of contract work performed prior to the notice of termination and reasonableness of charges related to the termination. 
The termination settlement is calculated by multiplying the contract price by the percentage of work performed and adding the reasonable charges related to the termination. Your objective should be a settlement that compensates the contractor fairly for the work done and the preparations made for the terminated portions, including a reasonable amount allowance of profit. The amount payable under settlement must not exceed the contract price, less payments otherwise made under the contract. From that amount, you must deduct any disposal or other credits. The biggest problem is often the atmosphere surrounding the termination process. While the atmosphere surrounding a new contract negotiation is one of hope and a new beginning, the atmosphere surrounding a termination is one of lost opportunities. Many times it is the atmosphere of distrust and resentment. You must not allow this atmosphere to drag you into a win-lose negotiation. We have to keep professional. We have to really work to try and find a win-win um, ending for both of us. Mahalo for joining me to learn about procurement pricing today. We stepped through the procurement life cycle to find each point where some kind of pricing work is required. Should you need any help in your pro pricing determinations, please do not hesitate to call the SPO team. Remember, your manual has much more guidance than I was able to share with you today. Always refer back to your manual. Thank you to the SPO team, the Hilton, our camera crews, and vendors for making this day a success. And most of all, thank you for attending our SPOCON event. Happy weekend and mahalo. Thank you. <laughs>